So hello, thanks for joining our presentation. Today we're gonna to talk about IPVCU, where we're actually going to exploit some leaked identifiers in IPv6 and use that for street level geolocation. My name is Rob Beverly and with me is my co-author, Eric Rye. So in this talk, I'd like to first start by giving an overview of our work and then move on to presenting some background, make sure everyone has the right context for understanding all of the different uh, techniques and tools that we actually used. Then Eric is going to give a presentation on IPVCU. He's going to talk about the tool itself, give a demo of the tool, then we'll talk about some conclusions and take any questions. So let's move right into the overview. <clears throat> IPVCU revolves around home routers, and home routers are interesting. For instance, do you have IPv6 at home? Many people think they do, but may not even know. Also, many people don't know how their router is configured. They may not have ever touched it in the entire time it's been installed. We certainly didn't understand the exact way it was configured. And last, you might be surprised about what your router actually reveals about you through IPv6. So as an overview, what is IPvCU in a nutshell? So it turns out that routers, primarily residential low cost routers that are deployed in the wild, use a form of legacy IPv6 addressing, which I'll talk about later. And it turns out that anyone, meaning anyone who's able to send a ping six or a traceroute six can actually find these routers geo physical geolocation and do so with street level precision. So for instance, a residential subscriber's home. So on this map, I've <coughs> displayed a pin that has a slash 64 IPv6 prefix that's been assigned to a particular residential customer. And we can actually geolocate down to the street and even house where that actual prefix is located. So our contributions, what did we do in this work? So the first thing that we did is we developed a technique to find residential routers. This is really a needle in a haystack type of problem, given the massive size of the IPv6 address space. So we developed a large scale high speed active measurement campaign to actually find more than 60 million residential routers in the wild. And these 60 million residential routers actually reveal their hardware MAC address in a way that I'll talk about in a bit. Next, we gathered uh, around 450 million BSSID. <clears throat> These are the MAC addresses of the Wi-Fi <clears throat> BSSIDs that map to geolocations through various Wi-Fi geolocation databases, such as war driving databases. We then developed a technique to infer the mapping between a device's WAN, the wide area MAC address, and that same device's Wi-Fi BSSID MAC address. And then we performed a large scale data fusion to actually merge these two and geolocate IPv6 prefixes of home routers. So let's get some background and a bit of an IPv6 primer. <clears throat> so we all know that IPv6 addresses are big. They're 128 bits and they're represented as hex as I've shown in this particular example. There's some particular properties of IPv6 that are relevant. <clears throat> For instance, there's a huge address space. And not only is the, huge, is the address space huge, it's very sparse. There's my, many portions of the IP address space that are, there's no host there, there's no prefix assigned. So what this implies is that there's no way to actively probe the entire IPv6 internet, like we do sometimes with tools such as ZMAP. Further, even residential customers, like home customers, are typically allocated a prefix of size slash 64. That's the smallest prefix. So this is actually two to the 64 addresses. That's a lot of addresses. And the implication here is that there's no NAT, there's no network address translation, which is common in IPv4. And so the underlying implication of all of this that you need to have in the back of your mind is that IPv6 is deployed somewhat fundamentally different than IPv4. As an example, if we consider the home router or what we often will call in this talk, the CPE or customer premises router, that router is actually a routed hop. So in this picture, you'll see the provider router has a connection to the CPE router, for instance, in the home, and there's an actual point-to-point -point subnet between the provider router and that CPE router. 
Then there's a separate subnet on the other side of that CP router <clears throat> that's the customer subnet that all of the machines in the residential uh, home, for instance, get addresses out of that particular subnet. We call this, uh, this uh, link between the provider router and the CPE router, the IPv6 periphery. As I mentioned, the smallest allocation in IPv6 to a, e.g. to a residential customer is a slash 64. And you might say, what's a home to do with two to the 64 addresses? That's a lot of addresses. But there's also a fundamental problem. Every device needs to have a globally unique IPv6 address. So how do devices choose an address within this slash 64? Well, there's a couple of ways that this is done, but the ways that I want to present today involve two primary techniques. The first is privacy extensions, and the second is EUI64 or Slack. <clears throat> so today, what typically happens are privacy extensions where the lower 64 bits are random and short-lived. However, there's a form of legacy addressing where <clears throat> the lower 64 bits take an encoding of the hardware MAC address. And I'll talk about that next. So to understand EUI64 addresses and also all of our work, you have to understand MAC addresses or layer two hardware IEEE MAC addresses. And as we all remember, MAC addresses are six bytes and typically written in hex. The upper three, the high three um, <coughs> bytes of a MAC address are something we call the OUI, or the Organizational Unique Identifier. And this is the hardware manufacturer that owns that block. So this is the entity, for instance, that paid some money to the IEEE to reserve a chunk of MAC addresses. So an IPv6 EUI64 address is formed as follows. It takes this six byte MAC address, splits it in two, and then in between it inserts <coughs> two bytes an FFFE. It then inverts the seventh most significant bit. So in this uh, example MAC address that I have above 00111223344455, that would then, if a host had that address and was forming a V6 address, it would take its assigned IPv6 prefix. And then for the lower 64 bits, it would use this EUI64 scheme. That turns out in this example to be 021122, then the FFFE33, so on and so forth. So what are the advantages uh, of EUI64 addresses? Well, they're simple to implement. They guarantee, at least in theory, unique IPv6 addresses. And there's no need for some of this other machinery, such as duplicate address detection, which can sometimes make things faster. But there's some strong disadvantages. For instance, it exposes the layer two or the ethernet address up a layer into layer three, which can reveal things about the device itself, for instance, the hardware, the vendor, et cetera. Also, this is a static address. It doesn't change because your MAC address doesn't change. So even if the device connects to a new network, it's gonna use the same EUI64, lower 64 bits. And this globally uniqueness of the EUI64 is going to permit tracking. So as a result of this, uh, well-recognized sort of weakness of EUI64, RFC 3041 was first back in, uh, you know, 20 years ago to define something called privacy extensions, where it generates a short-lived random interface identifier. It does perform duplicate address detection, and it regenerates this address often. So a single host may get many uh, addresses <laughs> over the course of a day. For example, here's uh, this... Uh, this upper slash 64 prefix that if you look at the lower 64 bits are seemingly random. So the privacy implications of these EUI 64 addresses have been known for 20 plus years, right? This RFC has been around. So you might say, well, of course, all devices use privacy extensions, right? Um, and we're gonna see exactly if that's true or not. So that's some background. Now, let me just uh, give you a high level overview of the impact of this work or what you're going to see. So in IPVCU, what we did is we've developed a remote unprivileged attack on privacy. And this attack works even when end hosts uh, utilize IETF's standardized IPv6 privacy extensions. So I've been talking about how 
uh, the IETF has adopted privacy extensions, but the fact that the routers that these hosts are connected to actually compromises their privacy and their geolocation privacy. We've developed a tool, so IPVCU is also a tool that can map an IPv6 router address to a precise uh, geolocation. And we've done this at scale across the entire internet. So we've done a precision geolocation and we were able to geolocate approximately 12 million residential IPv6 routers all around the world and the uh, IPv6 prefixes that are allocated to those routers. Then we extended this idea to perform geolocation of the provider's last hop infrastructure. And the really cool thing about this is now we can <coughs> geolocate IPv6 routers that do use privacy extensions uh, simply by associating those that don't do privacy extensions with those that do privacy extensions, basically implying that if any single uh, router on a provider's uh, network is using these EUI64 addresses, it compromises the geolocation privacy of all of the other routers. And then finally, we engaged in responsible disclosure and vendor remediation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Eric, who's going to describe IPVCU in more detail. Hi, my name is Eric Rye. I'm also with the CMAN Lab. Uh, I'll be building on some of the background and IPv6 preliminaries that Rob discussed uh, during his section in order to talk about our project, which we call IPVCU. Uh, this is a high-level roadmap for uh, what IPVCU is. At its heart, IPVCU is a, a large-scale data fusion attack that combines uh, EUI64 IPv6 addresses with Wi-Fi geolocation data uh, via an algorithm that we developed in order to produce um, IPv6 street-level geolocations for a particular subset of uh, IPv6 CPE, or Customer Premises Equipment Routers. Uh, I just want to touch briefly on ethical considerations because uh, in this study, we are attempting to geolocate with a high degree of precision um, some IPv6 addresses. Uh, we felt it necessary to consult with an institutional review board or IRB before proceeding. Uh, we agreed to follow all best practices as they uh, pertain to minimizing any potential for harm to befall any individuals during this study. Uh, for instance, we, we never attempt to identify any individuals that, uh, uh, um, that map to the MAC addresses or, or IP addresses that we discover. Uh, we encrypt all of the data that we have um, at rest, and we publish only the uh, aggregate data analysis rather than the underlying data itself. Um, and again, it's, it's worth uh, remembering that our, our goal here is ultimately to improve privacy protections by highlighting this uh, location privacy vulnerability that IPVCU exposes. Okay, so at this point, we'll talk about um, each component of IPVCU um, in turn. And the first component we should talk about is uh, our corpus of EY64 IPv6 addresses. Uh, so it's worth recalling that in IPv6, the, there's no NAT as opposed to IPv4. Um, and in home, uh, your, your, your LAN uh, prefix that's attached to your, your gateway router is a, a routable prefix. It's globally, ad uh, globally addressed. Um, and so in IPv6, um, as opposed to IPv4, we can do things like uh, send trace routes to uh, an address that exists inside of your home gateway from across the internet, for instance, because in IPv4, typically your, your uh, home LAN is a RFC 1918 network, that's, that's not possible in IPv4, but it is in IPv6. Another key observation in IPv6 space is that um, typically uh, the smallest IPv6 subnet that you can be allocated by your provider is a slash 64. And the reason that that is, is because um, in IPv6, there's no real reason to manage the IP space um, in the same way that there is in IPv4 because it's so large. Um, and so typically devices are, are permitted to generate their own IPv6 address uh, through a process known as stateless address auto configuration or SLAC. And SLAC requires that the lower 64 bits of the address be uh, generated by the device. And so it's not possible to address anything or to, to allocate anything smaller than a slash 64 from your provider. And so combining these two um, observations, uh, we are able to discover CPE route routers by um, trace routing to a random target address in a each slash 64 in a provider's network. Um, and so while it's, it's very unlikely be, uh, that the target address will exist because, we're, uh, because the uh, network inside of a customer's uh, home or business is at least a slash 64, um, and we're, we're randomly guessing the lower 64 bits of that address, um, we're not actually attempting to, to hit a device that's inside of the customer subnet. Instead, we're hoping that a trace route um, 
one of the packets from our trace route reaches the CPE router and its hop limit expires, which will cause the CPE router to uh, send an ICMP v6 time exceeded message, which is essentially the analog of an I uh, ICMP TTL expired message in IPv IPv4. Um, and hopefully, in the best case for us, uh, that CPE router will be responding from a source address that's an EUI64 address. Um, uh, while I, I've, I've talked through this example um, using traceroute, in practice we actually use YARP, which is essentially a stateless traceroute that Rob um, developed several years ago. Um, and over the last two years, as part of several different um, uh, large-scale experiments, we've discovered hundreds of millions of EUI64 IPv6 addresses. And from those IPv6 addresses, uh, we've derived more than 60 million distinct MAC addresses that correspond to the WAN interface of, of mostly CPE routers. The other data source that we use um, in IPvCU is uh, Wi-Fi geolocation uh, databases, data sources. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll be using the, the term BSSID or BSID, which stands for Basic Service Set Identifier uh, frequently. All I mean by that is the, the MAC address of the Wi-Fi interface on, on a Wi-Fi access point. Um, so anyway, for IPvCU, we amass a, a large corpus of, of BSSID to geolocation pairs, both by leveraging open source geolocation databases, for instance, OpenBMAP and OpenWiFi.su that are war driving databases that are provided to anyone on the internet who would like to download them. And in addition, uh, we generate more BSSID geolocation pairs by querying uh, geolocation APIs. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Weigel.net. Uh, Apple also has a location services API uh, for which you can, you can query BSSIDs. And if the, geolo if the BSSID is known to the API, it will return the geolocation. Um, so through combining all of these sources of data, we amass a corpus of, of slightly less than, than half of a billion BSSIDs uh, geolocation pairs. Um, so on the one hand, we have this large corpus of uh, BSSID geolocation data. And on the other hand, we have a, a, a large number of WAN MAC addresses that we've derived from active probing by discovering EUI64 IPv6 addresses. And so the question then becomes, um, you know, how can we combine, how can we resolve uh, these two separate data sources to uh, the same device? In other words, is it possible to match a WAN MAC address to a BSSID? Because if we're able to do that, um, then we're able to geolocate an IP, the IP address that that WAN MAC address came from to the geolocation that's associated with that BSSID. And so that's the fundamental question that our algorithm um, is attempting to address. So the mental model that we started out with and the one that you should have um, in your head is, is the following. Uh, many particularly low cost CPE devices that are um, provided by uh, uh, internet service providers to their customers at, uh, either for free or at a low cost rental cost um, are all in one devices. That is, they're a cable modem, they're a router, they're a switch, and they're a wireless access point all in the same physical box. And many of the, these devices are, are system on a chip designs wherein all of the radios and interfaces are, are designed by a same, the same company. Because each one of these interfaces gets its own MAC address, oftentimes these MAC addresses are related. Um, for example, in this figure on the bottom right, that's uh, just an example, but often represents reality for many of these CPE devices, each one of these interfaces um, is sequentially addressed. That is, the two BSSIDs are one apart from each other, uh, the WAN MAC address is one up from the 5 gigahertz BSSID, and the LAN MAC address is, is one up from the WAN MAC address. Um, and so what we're interested in uh, are having our algorithm do here is discover what the offset between the WAN MAC address and the ABSSID is for a particular device. So in this case, um, the WAN MAC address or the BSSID is negative one from the WAN MAC address. That's the offset that we would that we would produce for, um, if we had one of these model devices that's pictured here in the bottom right. Um, this is not always as easy uh, in, in practice as it is in theory. There are many complicating factors. Um, including some devices have you know, a varying number of interfaces. It's by no means guaranteed that a wireless access point will support both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, for example. Um, some newer CPE devices have Bluetooth interfaces, uh, for example. And so there's not one single offset that's going to work for every uh, device. In other words, different devices are going to have different offsets between their WAN MAC address and their BSSIDs. But in the best case here, we're able to uh, identify, we're able to discover a WAN MAC address via active probing 
in an EUI64 IPv6 address. So for example, in this uh, IPv6 address we have here, the WAN MAC address is embedded. And one or both of the BSS IDs is captured in some Wi-Fi geolocation database. That's the best case scenario for us here. Um, so to sort of visually represent what I've been talking about over the past couple of slides and also um, illuminate why this can be challenging, uh, what I'm demonstrating in this figure is uh, the first uh, is, is some BSS IDs and WAN MAC addresses. The first five bytes of the MAC addresses um, that are pictured here are all the same, and so all I'm picturing here on this number line is the sixth byte of the MAC address. A B represents a BSS ID, whereas a W represents a WAN MAC address. Um, so our initial attempt at a matching algorithm was, was what, I'm what I'm depicting here, uh, namely that if there's a BSS ID and a WAN MAC address that are adjacent, that is they're one off from each other, just call them the same device, just pair them and say that, that, that those, those, two, uh, th those two MAC addresses belong to the same device. That's a naive matching algorithm. Um, this can be complicated because some devices have, have multiple BSS IDs as we're depicting here. But for this particular OUI, which is the first three bytes of a MAC address, it's a, uh, a block that's assigned by an IEEE to a device manufacturer, we actually had some ground truth. And so uh, what I'm displaying here is the actual uh, ground truth as it applies to a device within this OUI. So each device from this OUI was allocated a series, a sequence of seven MAC addresses. Um, and the WAN MAC address is six below the BSS ID. In other words, the, offset, the BSS ID is an offset of plus six from the WAN MAC address for this particular device. And so later, if I find a MAC, if I find a WAN MAC address for something in this OUI, if I want to predict what the BSS ID is, I would simply add six to it. The end result for our algorithm is we produce a list of WAN to BSS ID offsets on a per OUI basis. And then we're going to use those later um, in order to geolocate devices. Okay, um, this is, this. I wanna be clear that this uh, methodology and our algorithm does not always work in 100% of the cases. There are many limiting factors um, that can cause things to go wrong. So for example, some CPE devices don't use EUI64 addresses at all. They don't embed the MAC address and the IPv6 address, and so uh, we're just not able to to attempt to geolocate those devices because we don't have a MAC address on the WAN side to begin with. Um, some devices are non-responsive to probes, and so we never get a response from them even if they do use EUI64 uh, uh, addresses on their WAN uh, interface. We have some limitations as it pertains to BSS ID collection too. Some devices are not all in one CPE devices. They don't have a Wi-Fi uh, built into the router or the, the cable modem. Um, some devices just exist in places where uh, geolocation databases don't cover, for example. And then there's some limitations as it uh, as they pertains to our correlation algorithm. Um, in some devices, the the wired MAC addresses and the wireless MAC addresses are allocated out of two totally different OUI. And for those devices, without having ground truth, it's very difficult for us to to know you know what the offset between the wired and wireless interface is. Although we believe that given ground truth, we're probably able to figure it out too. Um, and, and that those, those, those offsets are probably static even when they're um, within different OUI. Um, and finally, uh, even though our algorithm produces uh, a, a uh, offset on a per OUI basis, there's nothing stopping manufacturers from have, having different offsets for different devices within the same OUI. However, given all of those limitations, we still have um, a, a great deal of success using our algorithm to geolocate uh, IPv6 CPE devices. So by combining our WAN MAC address and BSSID data, we're able to geolocate at least 12 million unique devices out of the total 60 million WAN MAC addresses that we started with in almost 150 unique countries. And these uh, MAC addresses belong to over 1,000 different unique OUIs. Um, what this tells us is that EUI64 IPv6 address use in the CPE space as opposed to the endpoint space um, is extremely common and widespread. And uh, because we're able to geolocate so many devices, uh, this is a serious uh, location privacy concern for individuals, particularly because these devices often exist in their homes or businesses. The use of EUI64 um, IPv6 addresses uh, is and should be considered harmful. Um, in this presentation, we're primarily going to look at results um, in the aggregate, and in the one case that I, I do depict a single geolocated device, I introduce a massive amount of error. 
Um, so the first result that I'll, I'll, I'll display here um, uh, talks about our, our validation of our algorithm. We wanted to know, does the algorithm that I described in the last uh, several slides, does it actually work? And so what we did was we solicited volunteers that have CPE that uses EUI64 uh, addresses on their, their WAN interface. They told us what their internal subnet was. We uh, then initiated a trace route to a random address inside of their, their home gateway. Um, when the trace route reached their CPE, we obtained their EUI64 IPv6 address that it, that's on their WAN interface. Then we used our, our tool and our methodology in order to infer the BSSID and then geolocate their IP address in the best case. So of the small number of volunteers that we uh, were able to uh, solicit, uh, four out of the five, 80%, we were able to geolocate. Um, all of the accurate accuracies were less than 50 meters. And uh, oftentimes this was the, the geolocated point was on the opposite side of the house from, from the router itself. Um, so, so, so very, very precise geolocation. In the single instance at which we were not able to geolocate the, the IPv6 address, um, while the WAN IP address was EUI64, the WAN MAC address and BSSIDs uh, were, were not sequential. Um, here's another set of results uh, that describes what we can do when we look at a large number of geolocated uh, MAC addresses within the same OUI. And we're able to, to make claims about uh, what manufacturers do and how that affects the country level distribution of their devices. Um, so what I'm displaying here on, on the right is a graphical uh, de depiction of a Mitristar OUI, the CCD4A1 OUI. On the y-axis, I'm uh, depicting the fourth byte of a geolocated MAC address. And on the x-axis, I'm depicting the fifth byte of a geolocated MAC address. Um, points that are geolocated appear as a particular color. In the teal um, are MAC addresses that were geolocated to Argentina. And in the, the sort of fuchsia color are MAC addresses that were geolocated to Peru. So while it's been known for several years and suspected probably for far longer, um, Companies not, uh, you know, companies divide their MAC address space by by model. But what IPVC allows us to do is we can see country level divisions um, in how those devices end up actually being distributed as well. Uh, so we can see distinct bands that are allocated to to MAC addresses that are geolocated to Argentina, and distinct bands that are geolocated to MAC addresses that are geolocated to um, Peru here. Um, other OUIs, however, don't show that kind of banding. We see consistent geolo country level geolocations. Um, this particular graphic represents a one, this uh, OUI, this 1CD4, 1C24CD OUI, which is an ASCII Corporation OUI. Um, this shows us that you know almost all of these devices are geolocated to uh, to Switzerland, 32,000. Um, approximately are geolocated to Switzerland with much smaller numbers geolocated to surrounding countries. And um, this fits what our intuition should be because Swisscom, which is a major Swiss um, internet service provider, provides ASCII routers as its standard home wireless device. And so we would expect these things to primarily show up in Switzerland. And when they don't, they should be in countries that are, that are somewhat um, close by. Another thing that we can do is we can compare our geolocations that we derive from um, IPVCU to uh, the state-of-the-art IP geolocation databases, such as uh, MaxMind's GeoLite database. Um, so what we did here and what I'm depicting on the, the graphic on the right is I've uh, plotted all of the Xfinity routers. Um, there's more than a million of them in blue. Uh, their geolocation according to IPVCU. And then I've plotted uh, the IP addresses from which those uh, Xfinity routers MAC addresses came, came from according to their GeoLite, uh, MaxMind's GeoLite database geolocation uh, there in the, the, the orange. Um, all million of the Xfinity MAC addresses, the IP addresses that they came from were geolocated by MaxMind to, that, uh, to Kansas. Uh, that, that orange dot there in the middle, whereas all of the IPVCU geolocations are displayed in blue. And what we can see here is that uh, IP, it appears that IPVCU's geolocation is, is much more accurate than, than MaxMind's because they're not all geolocated to the same place. You might ask, does this actually mirror what, um, what Comcast's Xfinity internet service uh, um, uh, coverage map looks like. Uh, and so we went to the FCC and we got the Comcast coverage map and you'll see that it um, is almost a mirror image of, of what we derive from IPVCU. 
A final thing that we're able to do with IPVCU is we're able to geolocate some ISP infrastructure in addition to the CPE devices that we're able to geolocate. So if we assume that there is some physical distance constraint between the CPE device and the last hop that exists within the provider's infrastructure, what we can do is we can aggregate the geolocations of the CPE devices, and we know that the, the provider's infrastructure must be somewhere nearby. As an example, uh, what we're showing here on the, on the right-hand side is a trace route that ends with a EUI64 uh, IPv6 address that we can presumably geolocate. But now we're interested in the penultimate hop, the hop before that CPE device that is within the providers, the ISP's infrastructure. So what we can do now is we can start correlating all of the geolocations of the CPE devices by penultimate hop, that second to last hop that corresponds to something in the provider's infrastructure. And so the intuition here is that we can geolocate the provider's infrastructure by geolocating the CPE devices that are connected to it. And so I've done that here. Uh, we've done that here on the right-hand graphic, which is uh, depicts each color depicts a different penultimate hop, that second, that hop before the CPE device. And so we can see that these CPE devices, different colors are grouped into different regions and presumably the provider's infrastructure also exists within that same region, particularly if it's something that's constrained by physical distance, for example, a, a cable head end. And so now, just by geolocating the CPE devices that are connected to the ISP's infrastructure, we're able to, to, to geolocate that last mile infrastructure as well. But it gets even worse. Assume that I have bought a, a high-end CPE device that doesn't use EUI64 addressing. Now, if I'm able to geolocate the provider's infrastructure, even if I don't have an EUI64 CPE device, just by being able to geolocate that penultimate hop, we can geolocate at a coarser, a coarser grain my non-EUI64 device. In other words, simply living nearby uh, people that own EUI64 devices uh, is itself a location and privacy vulnerability for me. Okay, so that wraps up our discussion of uh, what it is that IPVCU is. At this point, um, I'll demonstrate a, or, or discuss and, and then demonstrate a tool that we've developed um, that assists in the geolocation of IPV, EUI64 IPv6 addresses. So our IPVCU uh, tool uh, works in the following manner. So assume that you have a, a, WAN MAC, uh, a WAN MAC address or an EUI64 IPv6 address that you want to geolocate. Um, what our IPVCU tool does is it calculates the pre predicted BSSID value using the inferred offsets that our algorithm develops. And then it queries one of three different uh, location APIs for, a for that predicted BSSID. Um, and then optionally it outputs KML for any geolocated uh, BSSIDs. So at this point, I will demonstrate the um, both discovering EUI64 IPv6 addresses using Traceroute and then using the IPVCU tool to geolocate those um, uh, IP addresses. So the first portion of this is just going to be uh, how to use Traceroute to discover EUI64 IPv6 addresses. So I'm sending a Traceroute to a random address inside of this slash 64 network just choosing a random lower 64 bits and then sending the trace route. Again, it's unlikely that anything inside of that slash 64 is going to have this address, but I'm simply attempting to get the trace route to the CPE device so that I can find what it's, uh, I, can, I can determine uh, the CPE device's address. And hopefully it'll be an EUI64 IPv6 address so I can attempt to geolocate it. So finally, at hop uh, 13, I get a response from a provider infrastructure uh, router. Notice that there's no pointer record here to help us with geolocation. As a reminder, in IPv4, often pointer records and reverse DNS help us to do some kind of coarse geolocation um, because the, 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 the pointer records contain some sort of hint that uh, indicates uh, where, where those routers are. In v6, this is often not the case. At hop 14, there's still no pointer record to help us out. Finally, at hop 16, or at 15 rather, notice that we, we found an EUI64 CPE device, but when we look it up in MaxMind, it's geolocated to that Cheney Reservoir in Kansas too, which doesn't help us. 
So now we want to take that uh, IP address that we discovered and use the IPvCU tool in order to determine what, um, where that, that IPv6 address is located. So we simply use the IPvCU tool that you're able to get on our GitHub. We pass it the EUI64 address uh, that we discovered using that trace route. And what it does is it, pr it predicts the BSSID value based on the OUI that the WAN MAC address from the EUI64 uh, uh, IPv6 address uh, would produce using our, our, our algorithm. And then ultimately uh, it queries, uh, in this case, the Apple Location Services API, which then returns this, this latitude and longitude, which is you know, much more accurate than, than uh, what MaxMind produced. So that completes our demo. Um, before we, we, we conclude here, I, I wanna mention uh, the responsible disclosure and, and remediation steps that we took uh, during, during the study. So this vulnerability is, is simple in theory to, to stop, right? The ideal remediation here is that CPE manufacturers must stop using EUI64 IPv6 addresses um, on their WAN and interface. Uh, these, these addresses are, 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 are you know, more or less deprecated in the uh, endpoint space, and they need to be deprecated in the CPE space as well. We've disclosed this uh, location privacy vulnerability to multiple vendors. Um, the vendors that we disclose this to account for millions of the geolocated, the 12 million geolocated uh, CPE that we found uh, during this study. We've got mixed results from the vendors that we disclosed this to. Um, on, on, on the one hand, uh, we've had vendors uh, or the, uh, tell us that they were going to cease using EUI64 addresses and, and use uh, privacy extension addresses on the WAN interface. On the other side, uh, we've had uh, vendors that have disputed whether they, they use EUI64 addressing um, at all. So finally, in conclusion, uh, IPVCU, uh, again, is a large-scale data fusion attack. Uh, we combine uh, EUI64 IPv6 addresses that we've discovered via active measurements with geolocated BSSIDs uh, that we derive from multiple sources of, of, of geolocated uh, geolocation data. Um, we are able to geolocate millions of CPE routers and even some provider inter infrastructure based on how those geolocated CPE routers uh, fall out on a map. And finally, because we can geolocate some provider infrastructure, we can also geolocate CPE devices at a coarser grain that don't use EUI64 addresses. In theory, this is easy to prevent. You just don't use EUI64 addresses. But of course, some of these devices last are out there for quite a long time, and these devices don't get updated. And again, even a single EUI64 router can compromise some of the privacy of non-EUI64 device owners um, by being able to geolocate some provider infrastructure. So at this point, um, I'll take your questions, but I want to first point out a couple of things. We're still seeking volunteers to help validate um, our tool and, and test our methodology. So please contact us at the, UR, the 6 cent URL there. And if you're interested in using our tool, it can be found at that GitHub uh, link provided there. Um, so thanks for listening, and I'm excited to take your questions at this point.